It's an unprecedented time filled with stress and uncertainty. And more than ever, Children's Health Care of Atlanta says parents need to make time for themselves. Acknowledge your feelings and allow yourself to feel them. Don't minimize those feelings. Avoid comparing how you feel to how others feel. We're all different. Practice healthy habits with diet and exercise. Follow a routine that can create predictability and offer a sense of comfort and security. Give yourself a break. You're doing your best. Set clear boundaries. Don't get sucked into working 24-7. Set limits so you don't get burned out. Focus on what you can control so your thoughts won't spiral and get overwhelming. Take five. Do something for yourself that's only for you. Make time for laughter and joy. FaceTime a friend. Social distancing doesn't mean social isolation. And finally, practice gratitude. It can help you focus on what you have instead of what you don't. For today's Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Um, John, you know, you write that this virus will likely keep spreading for 18 months to two years. And the forecast that, that you both put in there was until 60 to 70 percent of the population worldwide has it, which I know Mark has said earlier on this program is sort of how he defines herd immunity. You warned, though, that this could include a second big wave of coronavirus infections in the fall and winter. So the question to you, John, when you look at these numbers is, is could that wave be bigger than what we are seeing right now? It could be. Uh, you know, what we've seen so far has been controlled and, and lessened significantly by the actions we've taken. Uh, if those actions are released and people stop paying attention to social distancing, uh, you need to, even if, if we end lockdown, you still have to continue social distancing and other public health uh, measures. Uh, it could get considerably worse than what we've seen so far. A pretty sobering, a pretty sobering warning. I mean, Mark, you know, the virus has been spreading at least for about five months from what we understand. So far, according to official numbers, less than 1% of the world's population has been infected. Now, obviously, that number is, is going to be much higher than that, but it, it's still going to be pretty low as a percent of the global population. So to get to 60 to 70% in two years, just does that mean a huge acceleration at some point in your modeling, Mark? Yeah, well, I think the, of course, you can't get from 5% in a few months to 70% uh, without, uh, without a lot more cases uh, than we've had up till now. And so that would mean a bigger wave. If we keep it under control with really intense control measures, we might not get to 50 or 70% uh, by that time, but then we will still have uh, either the need for a vaccine or a uh, a population that's still still susceptible. So there's still so much we don't know about this virus. Researchers around the world continue to study it, hoping to understand how it spreads, whom it affects, and whether we can develop immunity. So here's what we do know. The virus appears to be killing men at a much higher rate than women. At least that's according to some of the limited data we're getting from a handful of countries. But researchers here in the U.S. are now trying to figure out if there's actually some truth to that. So they're conducting a study to determine if estrogen, a female hormone, can reduce the severity of symptoms in men. Well, we're joined now by Dr. Sharon Nachman, an associate dean for research at the Renaissance School of Medicine at Stony Brook University, and also from the same university, Dr. Antonius Gasparis, a professor of surgery. Thank you very much to both of you, because I want to talk about this study that is fascinating. Dr. Gasparis, I understand it was your idea, you thinking out of the box. You looked at the gender gaps in the death data, particularly, and you had an idea. Tell us about it. Yeah, it was pretty simple clinical observation. As you mentioned, the uh, gender difference that, and the severity of disease that occurs between men and women, that's really what started to trigger everything. And, and what uh, was your idea? Well, it was basically why, the question was why. You know, as you mentioned, about 80%, when you look at the risk of requiring intubation or mortality or death, it's about 80% males versus 20% or 15% in females. So why such a difference? And that led to me trying to see uh, in the literature what, 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 what do we know. And when you look at the strain of coronavirus, 
that was uh, responsible for COVID is a little bit different than what it is for other uh, previous infections such as SARS. And that gender difference was observed also in SARS. Mm -hmm. Now, when I looked at the literature, what I saw was that some animal studies showed that, the, that in uh, female mice, they were also had a protective effect. And when there was a block of estrogen in those female mice, that protective effect uh, was gone. So the fate of the, of the female mice was similar to the males. So making that clinical observation that I mentioned earlier, earlier as well as this data that I found, the question was, can estrogen administration uh, give a protective effect to males or postmenopausal women, for that matter, um, to prevent lung progression to require intubation? Uh, so this is fascinating. So you, I, I, I understand that you've enrolled the first patient putting men on estrogen, fe this female hormone. Dr. Nachland, uh, tell us about what you're actually doing. So this study is a randomized study mm -hmm. because we don't know if, in fact, it will work. So what we are doing is randomizing patients who are men over age 18 or women over age 55 in that they're postmenopausal to, by chance, either get an estrogen patch put on for seven days or placebo and to see how they do if they are less hospitalizations for COVID, less admissions to the ICU, and, in fact, less intubations. So, so with you, Dr. Nachman, just to stick with that, I mean, how do you think estrogen changes the body's immune response to coronavirus? I mean, what are you looking for here? What are you hoping it does to a man's body that it's already seeming to be doing to a female body? So we hope that it will, in fact, help their immune response when they see the virus. This amount of a patch, seven days put on for just once, will not have any feminizing effect on the men who are getting it. It may help the women who are over 55 to feel a bit better when they're postmenopausal, but it will not have any downside feminizing effect for these patients. We do hope that will help protect them against the virus. We are only enrolling people who are symptomatic from the virus who have positive COVID testing. So we are thinking that everyone who is in the study will in fact have already acquired COVID. So we're hoping it will protect them from progressing from the disease. Heavy cough, three, two, one. Inside this lab at Florida Atlantic University, two engineering professors are measuring Heavy the cough. power of a cough. Three, two, one. Using a dummy, they fill its mouth with a mix of glycerin and water. Then, with a pump, force the dummy to cough. Then wait to see how far the droplets travel. They fill the air, visible with the green laser light, simulating what happens when we cough. It generates particles in, on the order of 10 to 20 microns, which is roughly close to what the smallest uh, droplet sizes are when we cough. Take note how quickly the simulated respiratory droplets spread. One. The droplets expelled traveled a distance of three feet almost immediately. Within five seconds, the droplets were at six feet, then nine feet in just about 10 seconds. Remember, nine feet is three feet beyond the recommended social distancing guidelines. It's already reaching roughly nine feet now. It's still moving farther slowly. The fog of droplets lingered in the air, but kept moving forward taking just another 30 to 40 seconds to float another three feet. It's getting closer to 12 feet now. Yes, he said 12 feet. Over and over again, the simulated droplets blew past the six-foot mark, often doubling that distance. The professors say the droplets become less dense the further they travel, but they still hang in the air, still with the ability to carry disease. And watch this. Even when we put a simple mask on the dummy, particles still dispersed from the sides of the mask, though they didn't travel very far. Certainly, if you're not wearing a mask, you're supposed to cough into your elbow. But if you cough into your hand, this is what happens. Let's turn out the lights. I'll put my hand up against the mouth of this dummy and simulate a cough. You can see the droplets spray in all directions. They may not travel as far, maybe about three feet or so, but they spray everywhere. And they can linger in the air, possibly for as long as three minutes. Intensity of the cough matters, so we tested a gentle cough, too. 
The lighter cough didn't go very far at all, about three feet. But the question remains, how close is too close? Do you think, based on what you've seen in your own lab, that six feet is enough for social distancing? Six feet is, is a minimum distance that you should keep. It seems that... But further is better. Further is better. 